Okay, so anyway, Wilson asked for war in April of 1917. This is a lecture for my third hour class on March the 4th. Um, anyway, Wilson asked for a declaration of war, and the Congress gave him a declaration of war, but uh, almost 60 members of Congress voted against the war. So unlike Franklin Roosevelt 25 years later, the day after Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor, when the country was united like it never would be again, maybe, or it, it was more united than it ever had been before, uh, Roosevelt leads a strongly united country into the war. Uh, not Wilson. Wilson led a divided nation to war. However, get this down. When the war started, uh, the government took over the economy. Okay, write that down. The government took over the United States economy. And they ran it. They ran it. Uh, there was a committee formed. It was called the War Industries Board. Industry. Okay, industry. That's, that's the economy. Uh, you know, the hardware store, the cement plant, the uh, farms surrounding this town, the businesses downtown are all part of industry and the economy, okay? And the government's going to take over all that and run it. And the man in charge of the War Industries Board was a man named Bernard, Bernard Baruch, okay? Bernard Baruch. He's going to run that. And he had an enormous, enormous amount of factories. He told typewriter factories, you're, he just told them. You know, when I think about the government asking, just they didn't tell us to do this. They asked us recently to wear a mask because it might help. And people just, I thought we were going to have to stretch a net downtown to catch people jumping off of tall buildings, screaming about their liberty and their constitutional right. And I'm free to do this and free. Yeah. They didn't ask you anything. They just said, if you ran a typewriter factory, you're not going to make typewriters anymore. You're going to start making ammunition. We're at war. They didn't ask you. They told you. They told you. I don't know what how would we, we would react to a national uh, crisis, national crisis today. But anyway, uh, get this down. The War Industries Board set prices. If you ran a grocery store, you didn't decide what you charge for a pound of hamburger meat. They sent you a notice saying this is what you will charge for, it, or a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread. Rent. If you were a landlord and you owned apartments, you didn't, you didn't decide what you were going to charge your tenants. They decided. They said, this is what your rent every month is going to be. And get this down. They told factories, they told, this is what you're going to produce. Not only this is what you're going to sell it for, this is what you're going to produce. Uh, we need this for the war and you're going to produce that. They told farmers, these are the crops you're going to grow. You're not going to decide what you're going to put on the South 40. The government's going to instruct you as to what you're going to plant. They took over and ran the railroads. <clears throat> daylight savings time. We're in that now. What's the purpose of daylight savings time? Why do we change the clocks? They're debating in Congress whether to stop that now. Uh, Indiana, I don't think, I think it's Indiana. There's one state that never changes its clock. They just keep the same time every year. But why do we change the clocks in the spring? Longer days. Why do we want longer days? You what does that account? Huh? Less electricity. Yeah, you use less electricity. By the way, what does it take to generate electricity? Oil. Yeah, we're, we're in sort of an oil oil shortage now. So the less electricity you use at home, uh, the less oil you use, and maybe there'll be a little surplus of oil, and maybe the surplus of oil can lead to cheaper gas prices. Oh, yes, cheaper gas prices before we all commit national suicide. But anyway... Uh, they, uh, they, uh, daylight savings time comes right out of World War I. Use less oil. The more, more, less oil you use as a civilian, the more oil there is for the troops. They even regulated the government. Just think about it. And, and again, I'm thinking about this in this recent thing we went through where people were uh, besides themselves because they were asked, not told, but they were asked to wear a mask in public places. Uh, and, and how people were citing the Constitution. Uh, and when people started doing that, I knew immediately about those people. They had one thing they had never done. They had never read the, I don't know what Constitution they were talking about, but it wasn't this four page job right here. Uh, <clears throat> the government has all, this gave the government all sorts of power over you. You ought to read it and see how much. But anyway, uh, they uh, even regulated the number of uh, stops an elevator could make. If you were working in a 
skyscraper on the uh, fifth uh, on the tenth floor. The elevator might stop on the fifth, and you had to walk up five, or it might go all the way to the fifteenth, and you had to walk down. Because every time that elevator had to stop and start, it used more electricity, and they're saying we need to save oil for the troops. Get this man down, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. He was the chief uh, food administrator. They said, we've got to conserve food. The less food you consume, the more there is for the troops that are going to fight the war. Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. He was the chief food administrator. And uh, he came up with all sorts of innovative ways to save food. Chief food administrator. You couldn't go to the grocery store and buy whatever you wanted. You were very limited as what you could buy. Some days you would go and there would be no bread. Other days there would be no milk or eggs or meat. You know, and you just had to adjust your eating habits to that. Hoover came up with this plan. It was called Wheatless Mondays. What do you think that was all about? No bread. Yeah. Have we done this? Yeah. Well, why didn't somebody tell me for Christ's sake? I thought you said we stopped on April the 3rd. Where? What is the last note you have? Conch, oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you say we stopped at April the 3rd? Some, you told us the next exam was yeah, but I asked and somebody said, I said, where did we stop? April the 3rd. Good sound answer. Anyway, cry over spilled milk. Okay, we let me just ask you then. Um, have we talked about um, Joseph Oklahoma or Alvin York? Okay, you sure? Okay, good. Well, so we've done all this. Um, where I should have started. Uh, World War One. you know, we debated the war. A lot of people were opposed, but once the war started, uh, if you opposed the war, you were suspect, okay? If you opposed the war. It's a great era of intolerance. Intolerance means this: we all have to be the same. If you're not the same as everybody else, uh, we're gonna we're we're gonna get rid of you. Uh, and that's and that's the way it was in World War in, in World War One. Now, like I say, we debated the war loud and long. But once the war started, this movement get this down. This movement started called 100% Americanism. Write that down. 100% Americanism. And 100% Americanism was this. If you don't support the war, you may not be a true red-blooded American. You may not be a true American. And if you're not true, a true American, we don't want you. Uh, we don't want you. We don't want you in the country. You're a hindrance. You're not helping the war effort. You're, you're hurting it. Any minority uh, was, uh, could be subjected. I won't say all of them were, but they could be subjected. Anybody that was not like the majority was viewed upon as maybe working in league with the Germans to, de to defeat the United States. African Americans are going to be persecuted throughout the war. Roman Catholics, this was a Protestant country. Roman Catholics were going to be prosecuted. Communists, let me ask you something. Do you have the right to be a communist in the United States of America today? Mm -hmm. Yes. A socialist? Yes. A Nazi? Do you have the right to be a Nazi today? Yes. Yes, you do. You absolutely do. You have the right to be a pacifist? If you get your draft notice and say, my conscience tells me this, this is what we were talking about, conscientious objector, yeah. Uh, by the way, if you were a conscientious objector in World War I, how did people tend to view you? Did they just say, well, we respect that person by standing for standing by his morals? What did, what did they tend to view you as? A coward. Have we talked about this? Yes or no? Just barely. Well, okay. Anyway, yeah, you were, yeah, in other words, you came under suspicion. If you're a real red-blooded American, you're going to grab your gun and go fight. And if you don't grab your gun and go fight, uh, you know, you're suspect. You may not, you may be working against the war effort instead of for it. Uh, it's interesting. A pacifist, you know what a pacifist is? It's interesting. You know, how, how do they view pacifists? If somebody got up and said, you know, can you name any pac pacifist sect of Christianity, a group of Christians who are known for being pacifists? Yeah, the Hacksaw Ridge guy. I'm going to have to sit down and watch that movie. It comes up all the time. But he was a Quaker. Quaker? Yeah. Quakers historically. I can give you Quakers historically have been against violence and war. 
uh, and I, I respect them for that. that that's it's their deep, and that doesn't, you know, who's the who, who was the last Quaker president we had, by the way? In fact, as so far as I know, he's the only Quaker president we had. Nixon, he fought in World War II, actually combat. You know, Quakers don't say you can't fight. They just say our sect believes you can't. It's up to your, uh, it's up to the individual. And of course, I assume that young man in the movie, and I'm sure it's a true story, um, that he was uh, a Quaker. He did not want to fight, but he, he, he did not say, I don't want to serve my country. And he went in as a medic. And of course, let me tell you something there. I can't think of a job more dangerous than being a medic, okay, out between the lines trying to help people. You can't fire back. You don't even have a weapon usually. Uh, yeah, medics suffer a high casualty rate. You want a dangerous job in the military? Well, you just go be one of those guys. While everybody else is scrambling for cover, you've got your thumb on a vein trying to stop bleeding, oblivious maybe to all of that. So he was, and he saved a lot of lives. But he would not take up a weapon, and he would not, I assume that's what the movie is, and he would not fight. And did he win the Medal of Honor for that? Yeah, he got the Medal of Honor. Okay, he got the Medal of Honor. Well, uh, but most pacifists were viewed, pacifists, Quakers, those groups like that, they were viewed as cowards as well. And that's simply not true. And I can prove that to you very quickly here. The, uh, America's, uh, here's some World War I veterans. You can see how incredibly young they are. Here they are, off going to serve their country in war, the uniform of the World War I soldier. There are a group. And write this man down, Alvin York. He was the most decorated. Alvin York was the most decorated American soldier, the most decorated American soldier in World War I. What am I talking about? What does that mean? He was the most decorated soldier. He was the most medals. He was awarded the most medals, okay? Of, of, of all the five million men who fought in the war, he was decorated the most medals. And it's interesting because he was a pacifist. Get that down. You know, people say all oh, pacifists are cowards. Well, you're wrong. He was a, now people use pacifism to uh, obey the service, yes, but uh, most pacifists are honorable people who follow the dictates of their conscience. And by the way, if we ever get to the point in this great republic, I will just tell you this, that you can't follow the dictates of your conscience. Now, you may follow the dictates of your conscience and be put in jail for it, but if we ever get to the point where you can't follow the dictates of your conscience, we've lost the constitution of the country. Uh, but anyway... Uh, Alvin York uh, uh, was a pacifist, okay? Alvin York was a pacifist. And uh, uh, when he received his draft notice, he, he said, I'm not going. He read the Bible. The Bible says very clearly in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. That's a misinterpretation. That's not what it says. That's what you've learned all your life, and that's what I've learned all my life, and that's what he learned all of his life. Thou shalt not kill. But that's not what the, you know, that, that's in the Old Testament. What, which language is the Old Testament written in? It's in Hebrew, okay? And so in the book of Exodus, when it has the so-called Ten Commandments, what they actually say, what, it, what that verse actually says is, thou shalt not murder, okay? It doesn't say thou shalt not kill. But that's the way it was translated in 1611, because you've got probably all got the King James Version at home, and that's how it was translated. Thou shalt not murder. Uh, and so, but Alvin York read that as thou shalt not kill. And there's his mother. He was a Tennessee mountain boy. He told his mother, I'm not going to fight. And she was worried that he would be arrested and go to jail and so on and so on and so forth. So she went to the pastor of his church. He was a deeply religious young man. She went to the pastor of his church and the pastor of the church came down and talked to him and explained it to him. I guess explained it to his satisfaction that in some instances, Christians are allowed to kill. I mean, you ought to be able to figure that out on your own if you read the Old Testament, and nobody ever reads the Old Testament. Nobody ever reads the Bible. It's good enough just to say, I believe this is the Word of God, and it's absolutely true. Have you ever read it? Never have and never will. It's just good enough to believe it. That's all you need to do. Never read it. But if you read the Old Testament, my gosh, God's people are running around you know, killing thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. There was a prohibition against killing in war, uh, I guess all those people would be on the road to perdition. But anyway, he showed Alvin York where, uh, you know, he as a Christian could under certain circumstances kill people. And so Alvin York went to the war. And he gets to the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Write that down in October of 1918, not long 
before the war ends, October of 1918, York led a patrol of, I think, seven men. I think there were eight of them all together. And they sort of go down into this little glen, this little depression, and it's got trees and shrubs and grasses. And York and his eight men go down in there, and they find themselves surrounded by Germans, okay? And so they just sort of hunker down. And these Germans are straining to look. They're looking to see where the Americans are. And York was this Tennessee mountain boy who had hunted all of his life. And every time a German would look up, he would just shoot him right between the eyes. And he killed so many Germans. Uh, one of those Germans wished that his pastor hadn't talked to him. But anyway, uh, he killed so many Germans that 132 Germans, the Germans became convinced they were surrounded by the Americans and 132 Germans all of a sudden stand up, drop their weapons, and raise their hands. And in what must have been one of the oddest pictures in the history of warfare, you have these eight or nine Americans uh, marching 132 Germans back to the American lines and take them as prisoners of war. For that, Alvin York got the Medal of Honor. And, of course, he is our, was our, and is, I guess, our most decorated war a hero, but there were other great heroes. Write this man down. We'll bring this on down to home. Uh, this guy was from Wright City, Oklahoma. Have you ever been to Wright City? Have you ever been to Watts the Iron? Or have you ever played in Ida Bell or Broken Bow? Have you ever gone down there and watched the Iron Heads play? Well, I'll bet you he passed right through Wright City. It's not a very big place. He was a Choctaw. Write him down. Joseph Oklahombe. Oklahombe means man killer. And at the same, he was at the Argonne Forest at the same time uh, uh, Alvin York is capturing, and Alvin York and his little patrol are capturing over 100 German POWs. He's in the, this guy is in the same battle. He's a, are any of you Choctaws? Anybody here a Choctaw? Okay, well, he was a Choctaw uh, Indian from Oklahoma, Choctaw Native American from Oklahoma. And at uh, the same battle, he and 23 of his fellow Choctaws, okay, 23 killed 80 Germans and captured 171, okay? You don't have to write all those numbers down, but he, he killed, they killed uh, more uh, Germans and captured more Germans uh, than Alvin York and his men did. But this man did not get the Medal of Honor. Actually killed and captured more than York did, he and his patrol, but he did not get the Medal of Honor. Uh, and he did not get the Medal of Honor, get this down, because he was not a citizen of the United States. Get that down. When did Native Americans, when did the Congress, it's called, it's called the Indian Citizenship Act. When did that, when was that law passed? The Indian Citizenship Act. 1924, okay, got that down, 1924, which is after World War I, which my point is this, you know, anybody that puts on the uniform or anyone that puts on the uniform to go and fight for their country, to risk their life for their country, I think they deserve the respect and admiration of the people of that country. But I think this is about, I mean, this young man and his fellow Choctaws, I tell you, I think that's above and beyond the call of duty because they were well, they love this country so much. They love this country so much that they were willing to put their life uh, on the line for it, even though the country didn't recognize them as citizens. So I believe that's a step and above, okay? Uh, but he did not get the, uh, he did not receive, the, he did not receive the Medal of Honor. I'll tell you something else that Oklahoma did. The Germans had broken the American code and they could read our messages. And he said they can't read this language. And they started sending messages in Choctaw and the German linguists could not, they just couldn't figure that out. So our messages were safe. And by the way, these people, get this down, are called the code talkers. And the code talkers are really going to take, you know, technology advanced greatly between World War I and World War II. And boy, the code talkers are really going to play an important part in World War II. The code talkers in World War II were Navajo Indians, okay, Navajos. Uh, and the Germans never were able to decipher the Navajo language or the Choctaw, the Choctaw language, okay. Um, this man uh, lived a long time. Joseph Oklahoma, he 
uh, and would have lived longer, but he was walking down the road and was struck by a truck in McCurtain County and killed, but he's buried in the cemetery uh, at Broken Bow. Uh, here's another uh, hero from World War I. Write this man down. His name was Henry Johnson, Sergeant. There you see him, Sergeant Henry Johnson. He was from Harlem in New York. Harlem was the most famous African at the time. It's no longer that. I think it is a Latina, uh, I think uh, Puerto Rican, maybe, uh, majority there now. But uh, in, the 19, in 1918, uh, it was a, uh, uh, an African-American uh, community. And in the 20s, you're going to have a thing called the Harlem Renaissance, where people like James Baldwin, famous African-American author, James Baldwin, music, Louis Armstrong, jazz, jazz is the forerunner to rock and roll. All, you know, authors, artists, painters, uh, you name it, Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance, okay? Uh, well, that's where he came from, Harlem. And, uh, you know, uh, the military was strictly segregated. And so what happened was is that in Harlem, in Harlem, African-Americans formed uh, the 369th, 369th Harlem Hellfighters. That's what they call themselves. And by the way, they were so feared by the Germans. Listen, this guy was so, he killed so many Germans, they called him the Black Death. Uh, the Germans were scared to death of him. And, uh, you know, uh, at first, when these African American soldiers got over to France, they were assigned these menial tasks. If the camp had to be moved, if the trenches had to be dug, if they needed cooks, whatever they needed. To, to take care of white soldiers, they put black soldiers doing that. But by the time the United States arrives uh, in Europe, France was so desperate that a French general, act, actually he saw a group of African-American soldiers doing labor over there, and he asked General Pershing, uh, can I, you know, can I use, the, if, if you're not going to use those men in combat, can I? And Pershing said, sure. Go ahead. And you'll notice in this picture here, there's a picture of some of the horror. They're not wearing American helmets. Those, I don't know how well you can see, but they're wearing French helmets. They literally fought as a unit of the French army, but they were, of course, fighting for the United States. And, of course, his moment of glory came. One of his moments of glory, he was out between the trenches. Here were the French lines, and here were the German lines. And, uh, you know, you'd put pickets out there. Uh, and that was one of the most dangerous jobs to be out between the lines, but that was sort of, they had soldiers out there, and if uh, the enemy tried to launch a sneak attack, they would fire their rifles and warn everybody back in the trenches here. And so that's what Henry Johnson was doing one night with one of his buddies, and a patrol of 30 Germans came out. Those Germans had been assigned to capture an Allied soldier. Don't kill them, capture them so we can bring them back and interrogate them. And so these 30 Germans sneaked across no man's land and they sprang a surprise on Henry Johnson and his friend. Uh, Henry Johnson and his friend, though, recovered pretty nicely. Uh, they fired their rifles, ran out of ammunition, then they fired their pistols, uh, then they picked their rifle butts up and they, uh, you know, beat them, beat Germans, literally beat them to death with their, are you awake, mister? You're not. Get up, get your stuff, go to the office and tell them you're tired. They've got a place down there for you. <clears throat> hurry, I'll wait on you. You're wasting my time. Just go tell Coach Green. He's waiting on you. Right. <clears throat> and go to bed tonight. Anyway, they're out there, and uh, they uh, beat Germans to death with their rifle butts. They bayonet Germans, and finally... Uh, his buddy got wounded and a group of Germans jumped on him to uh, drag him back to the lines. And the only thing that Johnson had left was a bolo knife. I used to have a picture of a bolo knife up here. I don't know what it is, but uh, I don't know what happened to it. But anyway, there's a, it's a curved knife and it's razor sharp on both ends. And you can literally slash someone to death with it. And that's what Henry Johnson did. He fell in on those Germans trying to drag his buddy off and he killed most of them. Of the 30 Germans that attacked, and, and by the way, he gets he and his buddy get back to the to the American lines. Johnson was wounded 29 times in that fight. Not all of them were severe wounds, but he was shot a couple of times. He was cut up. He was beaten. Uh, but of the 30 Germans that tried, of the 30 Germans that tried to uh, 
uh, take them prisoners, only one made it back uh, to the German lines, uh, either not wounded or killed, okay? Um, so, and by the way, he wins, he wins. Uh, he did not get the Medal of Honor, but uh, until later. The Obama, see, he's got that right there. There's the Medal of Honor, but the Obama administration, uh, just a few years ago, posthumously awarded him the Medal of Honor. But he did in his own lifetime while he was in France. He rendered such a courageous service to the war effort that the French gave him the highest military award that the French award, and it's called the Croix de Guerre, which is the cross of war, the Croix de Guerre, okay? So uh, Henry, Henry Johnson, all right, the Croix de Guerre. Well, back home, get this down, back home, as soon as the United States went to war, the loyalty issue arose. Get this down. The loyalty issue. In other words, the government is worried. Loyalty. The loyalty issue. The government is determined to find out. The government is determined to find out who in America supports the war and who doesn't. And if you don't support the war, you are considered to be disloyal. Uh, I can draw an analogy between then and now by just talking to you for a couple of minutes. You know, we have been, since, since 2001, we've been in the, the so-called war of terror. And one of the great fears that we have is that a terrorist, someone from ISIS or some other group, might cross into the United States and form a terrorist cell uh, and do harm to the American people. In other words, take over the water supply of a major American city, contaminate it, and kill half a million people in a few hours. It's a great fear. We don't think about it 24 hours a day, but I assure you the government does. Well, there was a fear, get this down, that the Germans might send agents into the United States to attack the U.S. home front while the war was going on, and they actually did that. Get this down. It wasn't just a fear. At Black Tom, New Jersey, there was an ammo plant. There was, a, there was a factory that made ammunition, Black Tom, New Jersey. And a group of German spies managed to sneak in there, and they blew it up. And it was a horrific, many Americans were killed, and it was a horrific explosion. New Jersey sits just across, New York, I might have mentioned this the other day, New Jersey sits just across the harbor from New York City. Uh, and when that explosion went off, uh, it hurled parts of that factory out into New York Harbor. It hit the Statue of Liberty and damaged it. And so that just drove home the point to the United States government that we had, the government said we had better, we had better, uh, you know, start finding out who in this country is a loyal American and who, and who is not. And so the first thing the Congress does, get this down, you don't have to write it all down, but write down the Espionage Act of 1917, the first thing that the government did in 1917 uh, uh, when we go to war was to pass that law, and that law is called the Espionage Act. What is Espionage Act? What does Espionage mean? It's spying. Espionage, es espionage is spying, okay? So, espionage is spying. So, uh, this, was, this was a law passed in order to... to uh, find out and arrest anyone who was disloyal. And you don't have to write all this down, but I want you to write down the gist of it, okay? So the Espionage Act of 1917, get this down, the Espionage Act of 1917 said that a person, you can see right up there, you, know, you don't have to copy this verbatim, but you could be fined 10,000 bucks, and to say find somebody ten thousand bucks in 1917 would be like finding you two hundred fifty thousand dollars today. Not only could you receive that fine, but you might go to prison for twenty years if you did any of the following things. Get this down, and this is to bolster loyalty. It's to make the American people support the war. It's to find out who's against the war, and to punish them for opposing the war. So you could a person could receive a $10,000 fine, or go to prison for 20 years for interfering with the draft. Get that down. You can write some of these down. Interfere, you know, if your neighbor gets his draft notice saying report on July the 10th, tell your neighbor not to go. Tell your neighbor the government doesn't have the power to send you overseas to shoot the Germans. Tell your neighbor the Germans have done nothing to you. Why should you go kill Germans? 
Number two, encouraging disloyalty, okay? If you encourage someone to be against the war, if you encourage someone to be against the United States government, if you encourage someone to say, gee, uh, you know, what can we do to support Germany in their war against the United States? And then look at this. $10,000 fine, 20 years in prison for saying, uttering, speaking, printing, writing, or publishing any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government of the United States. In other words, you could get 20 years in prison for criticizing the government of the United States. What if we put everybody in prison today who criticized the government of the United States? How would that go? Uh, why is that? It's the national sport. It's our national pastime. It's our national pastime in this country to criticize the government. Turn on television and watch the comedians. They're criticizing the government. Go to the floor of the House and the Senate. They're criticizing the government. Go down to the coffee shop. Go down here to McDonald's, and there's a bunch of old men that meet in the morning, and they, I assure you, they're in there carping and griping about the government. By the way, do you have the right to criticize the government? Which one of your rights cover that? First, what does it say? Well, well, you've got freedom of speech, but it also says you have freedom of petition. If you think your government's doing something wrong, you have the right to petition that. You can protest. Petition the government and say what you're doing is not right. That's in the First Amendment. I wish some Americans would read the First Amendment, but that's in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Did they not have that back in World War I? Yes, they had it. You're a good point. Okay, well, uh, one thinker this morning. Good point. Yeah, how's that happening? We have the same Constitution. Let me ask you something, and since you raised this question. Is this Constitution good only in peacetime, or is it good in wartime? You think so? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, uh, let me repeat. Is, is it good all the time, or just in peacetime? So you've got freedom of speech, even when we go to war. If we go to war, you have the right to stand in front of the White House and scream, no war, get out of the war, stop the war, the war is horrible, it's immoral, we shouldn't do it. Yeah. Yes? Okay, just remember that. Can you say anything you want to in this country? No. You can't? You're an American. What do you mean no? I, I, what do you I mean? What are you shaking that. your head no for? You don't have the right to say what you want to in this I country? You can. Well, well, that's my point. Can you have the right without penalty? Without getting in trouble, do you have the right to say whatever you want? What about like to a cop or something? Well, what about to a cop? That's free speech. Can you go up to a cop and be like, I'm going to steal from the store across the street? Huh? Like, well, you have the right to say that. You have the right to say, you know, is free speech free speech? Or do you just sort of have free speech in this country? You do. Huh? You do have free speech. You've got free speech. Sort of. Sort of? Sort of. Let me tell you something about sort of. Free speech, that's like saying you're sort of pregnant. You're either you're pregnant or you're not. Free speech, you have speech or you don't. Does that make sense? Is that what the Constitution said? So you can't say, you can't say, you can say whatever you want. I'm an American. I can say whatever I want. Is that or what, I, is what I'm asking you is what I'm saying correct? Is it correct, Mr. Watkins? Really? Huh? Yeah, I feel like this is a trick question. It is. I don't do trick questions. <laughs> when have I ever done a trick question? Is that right? Do you do you have absolute free speech? You can say what you want to. You're an American, by gosh. Yeah. Right? Yes. 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 Well, <laughs> just remember that. Just remember what you said. I'm out of time today, but just remember what you said. You wait a minute. You all said you're an American and you can say what you want. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I'm glad to find that out. Huh? Oh, really? Why? It's just like. Because you're in a room with someone who's actually read the Constitution, every word of it. That ought to make you nervous. Yes, what? <laughs> so, one of those in the world, they kind of. This is one of those. Well, I think. Well, I don't care what you think, Jess Rudd. What? Communism. What? They turn into communism. What do I have the right to say? 
We ought to overthrow the United States government. Capitalism is horrible. Republics suck, generally. Democracies die after 200 years. We need a communist dictator. We need a Stalin. And if he has to kill 300 million of us to, you know, to bring about that, well, that's okay. That's pretty much what they did. Do I have the right to say that? Yeah. Uh-huh. What they pretty much did then is they took control of everything. Well, yeah. And so they Do you have the right to be a communist? Yeah. A socialist? Wait a minute. We're not done. Just hold your little horses. Just, 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 just rain up a little bit. Maddie Ballard, come on the office, please. You Maddie understand. Ballard. You understand that according to this law, that you could be put in jail for criticizing the flag of the United States. Karen Burlow and Jay McCabe, come to the office, please. For criticizing the flag of the United States. For criticizing the Constitution. And you understand that when this law was passed in 1917, you and you and you and you and you could not vote. So if I got up in 1917 and said, you know what, the Constitution really isn't all that great because it won't let women vote. I think we ought to have an amendment that says women can vote. I think I should be put in jail for that. If I said, you know what, I think we ought to go back to the old blue uniforms of the Civil War. I think it's better. This all in green uniform. Critic- Look at that. Criticizing the flag or the Constitution or the uniform of the Army or the Navy. How would it? Did they really go that deep? Huh? Did they really go that deep? Well, I'm going to show you how deep they went tomorrow. I don't understand how that would happen. You don't understand what? How that espionage act passed. How is that going to be well, so you're thinking you are doing you are doing what I want you to do. You're thinking. You don't just know there was an espionage act, you're thinking and I'm tomorrow. I'm telling you. Democracy was just a disguise. They have tanks and we don't have to do <laughs> well, they're just kidding. It's I was going to say that no, yeah, you know, say you know, oh, like certain, certain words and things. Yeah. Like, actually, there happens even like, you can say them, but technically you will get trouble. Yeah. Well, there was a great case called Des Moines versus Tinker in 1968. Some people were wearing armbands during the Vietnam War. Uh, black armbands, uh, and that went all in the, in the school said you can't do that, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Other people were wearing t-shirts that said ethical draft, and you know, that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Yeah. <laughs> and, and all of that is tied together. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is tied to